Last week I was in Kanazawa on the Sea of Japan and uh, I went to visit the Writers Museum which is just across the road from the 20th Century Art Museum and opens an hour before it and uh, has air conditioning so it was a welcome refuge from the heat of the morning and um, I was particularly fascinated this is a uh, Writers Museum installed in an old school with very long corridors and some classrooms have just been left as classrooms but the others are given over to these exhibits boasting about or presenting the local writers. So there are two interesting things, interesting blockages that uh, strike me about this museum. One is on my part, which is that I don't read Japanese, so Japanese books have to be objects for me. And the other is the museum's blockage, which is that uh, literature is intangible and cerebral, conceptual, uh, and yet a museum is all about presenting objects in vitrines, in this case, or uh, with films, or displays of various kinds. You have to get inside someone's mind, and you have to uh, somehow make a translation or a summary of what made somebody an, a notable local writer. The museum is mostly dedicated, entirely dedicated to local writers from the Kanazawa area, and uh, you're greeted by a the video, uh, which is another thing I find fascinating. Um, what pictures do you show in a video about a writer's life? Well, of course, you show abstract pictures, uh, things which are suitably vague for, for two company readings, you know, so you show blossom floating on the surface of water, you show photographs of the author, uh, you show scenes of the city itself, the famous landmarks, the old wooden district, the castle, the city from above, historical photographs of the city, but you also want to throw a web of intrigue and charisma around the viewer, and so you uh, employ an actor with a silky deep voice, and this the case of this video, that was very much the case, this guy could have read anything, made it sound intriguing. I'm also kind of fascinated by the, uh, the vintage of some of these videos, they've been on constant display sometimes the worst for wear on old videotapes in, in the museums for years and uh, reflect the production values of, say, 1985. I was recently in uh, an Edinburgh museum, which is uh, the People's Museum, and it has a very, an incongruously, congruously with the museum, but incongruous with the city outside, socialist um, introduction video, which is actually up on the top floor. You really have to make an effort to find it. It's a darkened room at the top of some uh, crabby stone steps, and uh, it's um, full of interviews with old people who who must be long dead. I mean, they were old when they were being interviewed in the mid-80s. So, uh, the Writers' Museum in Kanazawa similarly had a kind of geriatric feel to it. Not only was it neglected and empty when I visited, but it was celebrating old people who subsequently became dead people. And yet, I, I do find old people, especially writers in, in old age, particularly inspiring. You know, W. H. Wadden's face definitely got better as he got older, as, he got, as it began to resemble a a limestone landscape or something. Um, Japanese authors, I'm particularly interested in uh, elderly male Japanese authors as they appear. I know I can never read them, I'll read them in translation which is not the same thing, but I'm rather fascinated by local writers who probably have never been translated. And I saw some very cool looking guys, um, for instance this guy with uh, a big bushy white beard and sort of 1970s glasses, I found particularly interesting. Perhaps he reminded me of an old Scottish man, a friend of my family when I was a child the kind of poets and historians and kind of renegade scholars that my family knew. Of course, Japan not only continues to be very different, but was particularly different at a time in the 30s when it was a fascist country and aligned with the Axis powers. So you can't help looking at some of the photographs of these writers and wondering what kind of war they had. What did they do during the build up to the Second World War, what was their ideological position, the same kind of questions you ask of German writers, although of course with German writers it goes on to be did they choose East Germany or West Germany after the war. Because although I can't read these books, nevertheless I sort of identify, or perhaps as a, as a consequence I identify with the culture they represent, and I particularly like the covers of some of these. I feel like I would be proud to have created such uh, mysterious and beautiful books uh, in a way that I just would never be uh, to be published by an English or British publisher which would no doubt give my book a 
horrible over commercial cover some of these covers were beautiful and some of them were fantastically didactic I, I particularly like this particular series this series of books is uh, published by Iwanami Shoten company and it's uh, this particular one is called uh, Tono Monogatari Life of a Mountain and it's about uh, legendary folk beliefs it's by Kunio Yanagita Iwanami Shoten Blue series is uh, subtitled Japanese Thought and it's mostly uh, ethnography, folk belief, uh, Japanese literature, folklore, ethnology, mythology. And here are some other covers from that same series which I've uh, discovered on Amazon Japan. I particularly like the grid layout and the way it looks as if the, uh, the lettering has been highlighted with a blue highlight pen. And the fact that there's a kind of intro, a little blurb on the front cover with a tiny illustration beside it. Just the way it's all laid out there and then the mile, the sower at the bottom representing knowledge, sowing knowledge, the seeds of uh, knowledge. But also um, there are these period photographs of groups of students, for instance, these are almost like cheerleaders apparently. They look like radical bohemian left-wing intellectuals, but I'm told they're, they're more like cheerleaders, uh, people who kind of do rah-rah acts for their, on behalf of their school. Some of them look far too old to be school boys and have full beards and things. In other cases, I'm just admiring the uh, amazing spectacles, for instance, of the, the writers or their the fact that they might be holding a cigarette with their mouth in a way that recalls Albert Camus and you wonder were they emulating Albert Camus or you might just stumble on one of the rare women writers and see a photograph of her as a child and wonder uh, what life was like for her or I might just start, um, be admiring the... because books of course are tangible in the end books are tangible and uh, to see a book with a a rice paper protective cover, for instance, which gives it a certain grey luminosity, especially when it's over just a typographical cover solution, beautifully simple and restrained and austere. Uh, then you realise that there is quite a lot to be said. I've, I've always treated books and magazines to some extent as talismanic. Uh, so there is a lot to be said for just uh, wandering around a, a room which is dedicated to the physical, the corporeal, existence of books and of course we're living in an age where books we're being sold the illusion from Apple and other computer companies that books are entirely platform independent and can transition easily to the digital devices that we carry around with us. I take issue with that. I think books need their corporeality and a, a writer's museum is actually a place that celebrates that uh, the status of books as objects, as corporeal objects. And what could be more object-like uh, or what could be a better celebration of the physicality of books than a really great bookshop uh, like the one I discovered later that same day uh, in a fashionable district of uh, Kanazawa, the district close to the 109 building uh, where Fumiko Amano's exhibition uh, is on nearby and just stumbled into this place which uh, was beautifully laid out, beautifully worn at the corners, a kind of uh, wabi-sabi environment um, with old chairs, old wooden tables, uh, with uh, old magazines and books, second-hand bookstore. I uh, don't know the name, can't read the symbols, but uh, of course the whole store presents me with that. In a, a modern Japanese bookstore I'm presented with uh, incomprehensible, fresh new books. But in a second-hand Japanese bookstore, I can understand at least the beauty of worn, used informational objects of another era, of another culture. And uh, I suppose the doubling of the inaccessibility or the remoteness of these objects is what makes them poetic for me.